What better way could there be to celebrate Women's Month and Women's Day tomorrow than to do that? So it's a great uh, honor to be able to welcome them to Gibbs and to welcome you to Gibbs to, to do the introductions and to chair the session. We also have the very great honor to introduce someone who is well known um, but whose uh, real life impact and influence on the world exceeds the very, very uh, considerable um, import of his paper CV, if you like. For some people, the paper exceeds the person. In this case, it's the other way around. Jay Nigel uh, is a, a long-standing friend of, of Gibbs. And Jay, it's very good to have you, have you back again. Jay is currently chairperson of GAIN, that's the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, uh, based in Geneva. <coughs> Committed to addressing malnutrition facing the two billion people in the world. He's also, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, uh, Jay, but uh, well known, <laughs> cabinet minister, um, founder, founding general secretary of the SATU, and uh, author, and general activist and leader. So, Jay, it's an honor to have you here and to hand over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, this is Jonathan Cook, by the way. And uh, from Gibbs, and it might be a bit of an oxymoron to describe me as a really good friend of Gibbs, but you can see how far the journey has come from founding Kusato to now be described as a friend of the most prestigious business school in the country. <laughs> so, thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank, first of all, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, which we had a great honor of bringing Mary Robinson to do the annual Mandela lecture here. And she did a fabulous job of it. I recommend that each and every one of you watches or reads her speech and see what you can do to implement some of this advice she gave us as a true friend of South Africa. Uh, I also want to thank Gibbs in particular for putting this all together and with the JJ Trust and with all the other partners, making this possible. Because I think this will be an extraordinary extraordinary event, an extraordinary session. And if, I, 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 did, I wrote an article today on, on Women's Day, and I, I absolutely am clear that women have had the most <coughs> profound impact on my life. From my great-grandmother who came here 150 years ago as an indentured laborer. When the British Parliament was called, called it slavery, they call it indentured laborer. And, uh, and she changed our, my line of ancestry forever. And, in a sense, laid a path that I have great humility when I went back to the village she came from and thought that she was so much more courageous than I had ever been in my life. And then to my mother who taught me the values of service, of integrity and honesty, and of treating everyone the same. And that was respect. And, and then to my wife, who I married, and taught me to be a human being, especially after being Kusata's in general secretary. And she gave me two boys and a, a wonderful daughter who in our last conversation a few nights ago said to me when I was talking about the choice between, you know, don't force me to make a choice between what your mother thinks and what you think. And she said to me, Papa, you must know there's a difference between blood and saliva. <laughs> I have never heard that before. <laughs> so, I've been completely educated about it. <laughs> so, you know, no. But as my life went on, there was this extraordinary people I came across. Mark Mashinini, I met probably in the late 70s, when I went to Kotso House. And Ma, I, I heard you before I saw you. Because you were surrounded by workers. And I just heard this voice and this militancy. And when she, I saw you, you didn't know who the hell I was, but you embraced me and said, my son, welcome to our family. And I learned at her feet. You are 80 years old. 80 years young. 80 years, 83 years. <laughs> if I could just half what you do today, at your age, I'll be so happy. But the thing about Maan Mashalini, who I call the mother of the modern trade union movement, is that she's an activist today as she was then. And so welcome to this conversation with Maan Mashalini. And I think many people, when we go into the townships, haven't learned your history. And I think one of the things Jonathan, you just begin to teach is the history of remarkable leaders like this that our country has produced. And then to Mary, who I encountered later in my life, but we instantly became connected. And Mary 
You know, I wish there were more politicians that are followed by that blue light brigade that I hear. <laughs> because you demonstrate the absolute simplicity and humility of a person that has been in political power. As a former president of Ireland, as a UN Human Rights Commissioner, you remain still an activist. And, and I really enjoy working with you because, in a sense, you connect intellect of the mind with the empathy of heart. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes you an extraordinary person. So I really hope that South Africans will take heed of your advice. And I wish more of us would talk up about what we need to do for ourselves. So I'm going to ask Mary to say a few words to you first, have a bit of a conversation, and I want this to be a conversation with you all. Questions. Things that both coming from different perspectives but carry extraordinary depth of knowledge and wisdom can share with us about the role of women, not just in South Africa, Africa, but the world. So, Mary? <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. It's <coughs> wonderful to be here and to see this audience uh, that I sense uh, has come here uh, to participate in a dialogue, not just hear one voice. But the one thing I will begin with is, you know, when I met Jay, I thought he was a little bit crazy, all right, you know. But now I know that a lot of people in Johannesburg are absolutely crazy. <laughs> and I saw them yesterday. The snow came. What do you do? Go out into the snow to be photographed. <laughs> He's so crazy. Uh, you know, uh, when I was invited to give the 10th Nelson Mandela lecture, and I didn't choose the theme, uh, which is a theme of freedom, truth, democracy, citizenship and common purpose. Of course, I had to try to address those issues. But as I was explaining to Emma, if I may, or Ma, yes, yes, I <laughs> earlier, uh, I, I, I felt it was important that, if possible, what I was going to say would be listened to and heard. So you have to say it in a particular way. And it was important for me in saying it that I was linking with my own country. I was president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. And I saw Ireland going up the economic ladder. We were making peace with Northern Ireland. It was a little bit later, but we were making peace. Everything was going very well. We became the Celtic tiger. And then we became rather selfish and rather foolish and did things that we now deeply regret and fell on our nose and are bloodied and have a financial crisis. But I see in the people a resilience and a determination. We're going to come out of this. And I think in so far as Many of my South African friends have been saying to me, and I've been seeing it and I follow quite closely what's happening in this country, it's not in the best place at the moment, and you all know it, but countries reinvent themselves. And there's no better time to do it than kind of anniversaries. It was a great honor to be giving the Mandela speech for the first time in Cape Town on the 50th anniversary of the imprisonment of Nelson Mandela Madiba, and to speak in the town hall in Cape Town, where he gave his first speech after coming out of prison. And a number, a number of people um, told me, as we looked out from the balcony, where some photographs were being taken before the lecture, um, and I was looking out at this big square, and they said, we wanted to see what he looked like. You know, he'd been so long in prison, his first speech afterwards. Am I doing that, or who's doing that? Anyway, um, you know, that in itself, uh, you know, made it very special, but you know, it's the 100th anniversary of the ANC, and that had to be addressed, and it had to be addressed honestly. Uh, there are issues, and you know them better than I do, and there are issues that have to be addressed. Yesterday I took part in another conversation on Women's Month. I'm so glad that the lecture was taking place in August, so that I could share with you uh, some of the uh, very vibrant, and I think very helpful discussion about Women's Month. And I heard very clearly there from Brigadier Lamb, from Grass Michelle, but also from a number of young women in the audience, that sense that the women's movement was so important, and you would know this, in the early years and in the 90s, and for the first few years of the new South Africa, and then somehow has now been a little bit sidelined. Some of the leaders went into representative politics, and somehow, and actually the same thing has happened in Ireland. Uh, we had our very strong issues. Uh, I remember uh, when I was a, new, a young lawyer, and the first thing I did was to, uh, when I was elected to the Senate at the age of 25, I was elected on a platform of change. And the first thing I tried to change was um, the fact that uh, it, it, the whole area of family planning was ridiculous. Um, I'm sometimes joked about this, but it's true. Um, 
married women could not avail of the contraceptive pill unless they could have their doctor certify that they had cycle regulation problems. And you know, go back to the weather. It must have been the Irish weather. <laughs> all the women had cycle regulation problems. <laughs> it was not against the law at all to use a condom, but it was against the criminal law to either buy or sell a condom. So, straight from the Harvard Law School, with what Nick described as my Harvard humility, I decided that this needed to be changed. I was now elected as a young senator, and I drafted a bill with two male colleagues to amend the Criminal Law Amendment Bill, and we tabled it, and it should have got a first reading automatically. It never got a first reading. I was criticized in newspapers. I was criticized, denounced from the pulpit by bishops and priests. The Archbishop, the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin said that legalizing contraception would be and would remain a curse upon the country, and all kinds of things. This was Ireland, 1970-71, and I learned a hard lesson there. But I also had a friend of mine, who was actually a renowned poet, Ivan Boland, who was a member of the Women's Liberation Movement in Ireland at the time. And she said to me, Mary, I'm going to a meeting of the Women's Liberation Movement. Would you give me seven laws that discriminate against women? And I said to her, Ivan, why only seven? I can give you at least ten, maybe twenty. <laughs> oh, no, no, seven will do. I've only limited time. And you know, that was the Ireland then. We had many. And that was when we had a vigorous women's movement. And we were struggling, and we, were, we knew what we were doing. And then somehow in more recent years, um, even though there are a lot of issues, we don't have to the same extent. So I'd love to maybe have some discussion on that. Mm. And I have been to South Africa quite a number of times. Uh, probably the one that I remember most was representing my country as president for the inauguration of President Nelson Mandela. And actually, one of the things that I remember very well was the evening before, in the town hall in Pretoria, sitting beside Archbishop Tutu and his wife Leah, and we heard the last speech as president of President de Klerk. And then he left, and there was a whole excitement and buzz of waiting for the president-elect, Madiba, to come into the room. And when he came in, there was such a surge of emotion as he went up to the platform and was going to make his speech. And Archbishop Tutu, um, Arch as I now call him, as one of his elders, mm -hmm. one of the elders, said, turned to me and said, Mary, I don't think you really understand what has happened in this country. And I kind of looked at him and I said, no, of course I don't understand. But what I do understand is only very recently that you voted for the first time. You know, so <laughs> putting him down a little bit. But uh, you know, it was that emotion um, and the singing by the um, South, young South Africans of different races as we came out and walked towards the lunch place. And the visceral roar from the crowd um, when the car passed the overfly of the, um, of the planes. And um, then two years later, I came here on a state visit, which was hugely enjoyable. And Kader Asmal um, kindly introduced me to the South African Parliament, got very excited as he did it, and kept, you know, at one point he said, We Irish! And everybody <laughs> roared. <laughs> and so, you know, I am full of these memories. I'll stop there because it's, you know, we're having a conversation. But it was for that reason that having been invited by the Nelson Mandela Foundation with that title, I felt um, it's important to speak as a true friend. And I've actually been very, um, uh, very positively encouraged by the response generally, which seems to be very much saying, yes, we know this too, and we're going to work on it, you know, which is very good. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mary. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to go into a conversation now, and you know, I'll ask a few questions, but I really want to throw it over to yourselves to, to really have a conversation with two extraordinary people here. But Ma, uh, it, it's very important that the Nelson Mandela Foundation, in fact, has set up a center of memory. And memory is such a vital part of our history, to know where we're coming from so we can analyze where we are and decide where we want to go into the future. And you had an extraordinary life. Uh, as a worker, as a woman, and as a person who was black. You know, we talked in, in, in our days, I mean, this, in the 70s and 80s, about the triple oppression of black women. But you did it. You succeeded in going into a job, in asserting your rights, in winning <coughs> rights for other workers, and becoming a leader. And as you reflect now on where you come from, you know, how did you do it in the first place? And what do you think of what's happening with women today? Well, 
firstly, I must say that as a woman, you are a human being. And as a human being, you are not going to tolerate seeing another human being being belittled or treated as not a human being. So that's the main thing that made me to be vocal, to speak. And this was during the time when it was the time of job reservation. You seem to be very young. I don't know if they remember. <laughs> <laughs>